Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfectly, thank you. Okay, yeah. let me just um, let me just make you loud on my end, um, so okay. that I can record it better. Uh, okay. All right. Sure. If if there are any problems with the audio, just let me know. <laughs> yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak to me today. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm fascinated by your um, uh, by your case. I was actually. I was originally alerted to it by, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with uh, Robin Ramsey of Lobster Magazine? Oh, no, not yet. I should oh, check okay. that. Well, he, he, um, he, he takes a, um, uh, I, I won't use the word sympathetic, but he takes a kind of a realist view with uh, targeted individuals such as yourself. And ha essentially, um, he has, a, there are a number of, there are a number of TIs, if you don't mind me using that part of who he uh, regards as kind of, you know, I extremely credible and you know, worthy of attention, and uh, you are one of them. Uh, so uh, I, uh, he's, he, he mentioned, um, I believe it was he mentioned your, you, you took your case to court. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah, and um, I guess it. Like, I read the, the papers when they were online. And I couldn't find them, but I checked recently. But um, uh, I think that they, they I th to my mind, they kind of demonstrated the difficulty of getting these cases to court. And I mean, I think, I mean, in your case, it seemed, to, at least in my mind, it seemed the judge was, you know, at least open to your suggestions. Yes, well, I the, the case was in 2016, and yes. um, there were three judges actually. Um, sure. So the very first one, Judge Spencer, he was uh, he was very very good, I have to say. Sure. And sure. um, uh, the second one was Judge Edis. Also, he gave me a time extension that I asked for, um, which I needed desperately for the sabotage. But uh, the, the third judge, uh, he actually skipped one bit of my evidence, which was a written email by um, Carl Clark, who was the MI6 whistleblower, who put yeah. in writing that his assessment was that I was being attacked by a special branch. And that's, that they that's are... absolutely fascinating. I'd love to get a copy of that if you could send it over. Yes, sure, I can. I'm so I'm about to make all my evidence public. Um, that's fantastic. And, um, and the I'm not sure. Are you familiar with the overall um, what's happening in the in this uh, to do with this criminality in the in the global sphere? Um, Shall I give you just a brief summary of well, where we yeah. are? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, I guess. So, sorry, my Skype's kind of acting up in the background. Um, so, give me one. Sorry, give me one second. Sure. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess, could you possibly, uh, yeah, first, um, yeah, tell, uh, it, it, it'd be great to talk about, I mean, do, do you think that it's, it's, it's necessary to um, uh, talk about that first before going into your, your particulars? Oh, um, I, whichever way round you would like. Um, I, I guess the only thing I wanted to um, mention as far as court cases are concerned is that, um, so mine was in 2016, um, in 2000, sure. in uh, a few months before there was the case of Philip Kerr versus um, MI5. Who, sorry? Um, it's Philip Kerr, so Kerr is written uh, K-E-R-R, -R -R. Yeah, sure. versus MI5. That was a pretty big case. Um, and um, and this is all you know. The, the court cases are great because they are public, a public record yes. with definite yes. documentation. And he has a website, um, and I have got the evidence that he submitted um, to court, and there are some bombshells in that. But also coming up are court cases. Um, one in Switzerland um, by a, a gentleman called uh, Mr. Thomas. And that's T O M Y S, and that will be on the first of February, um, and I'm I'm supporting that case as um, as a an expert witness, if you like, or a supporting uh, witness, and. Um, these cases are important. Oh yes, there's also the case of so the Mr. Thomas is on the first of February. On the fifteenth of February is a case in France. That's Frederic Laroche, also yeah. against Secret Service criminality, and uh, Mr. Thomas is in Switzerland. And then sure. upcoming this year is also my court case <laughs> because yes. I will go back to court. Um, and there's a, the case of uh, Melanie Richan in Belgium. Sure. Um, so. All of these, and then I'm also hoping that all of my um, three American colleagues will also start their own court cases in the U.S. because they're also being trafficked. But what's really important um, for us is uh, two executive orders by Donald Trump. One of them was on the 21st of December, which is uh, a global um, executive order uh, allowing to asset freeze um, the the assets of, of human traffickers uh, yeah. worldwide. And the second one was declaring January the anti-slavery, anti-human trafficking month 
and also declaring uh, human trafficking a national emergency. Uh, and that's quite something to take in, actually. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I guess, like, so, yeah, I, um, uh, what, yeah, if you could talk me through your, ex your, exp your, your experiences. So when, when did this, where, what, what happened and when did it start? So I went through um, a process like every single victim. Um, I yes. began with thinking that my targeting started um, and that that would have been, um, let me see, uh, the beginning of November 2011 yes. when I attended a high court case, which was uh, Berezovsky versus Abramovich. And at the time I was a researcher at St. John's College, Oxford, and I had changed um, I was in particle physics originally, then I changed to medical physics uh, for a project. And when I saw huge corruption in medical physics, I started, stu and, and also the financial crisis had happened, I started um, studying complex human systems. And as a researcher of that, I wanted to begin with the English legal system. Yes. And my first case study was Berezovsky versus Abramovich because it was so famous, it was in the papers, it was also the longest running case sure. I knew. And um, after the first week of attending court, just in the public gallery, just uh, witnessing, uh, um, MI5 began to stalk me, but in a very overt fashion, so that they placed an agent to wait for me in front of my drive every single morning and yeah. um, stalked me all the way to court and in the evening back home. So um, that's when it all began and it became ever more uh, aggressive after the court case. They didn't really stop the stalking. They started a program of, of um, well, I now recognize it as setting up certain conditioning triggers. So they would uh, play out the same scene over and over. They would be stalking me, guys in, in long gray trench coats and black hats would be stalking me. Yeah. Um, in Oxford repeatedly and then they expanded the stalking um, to to Germany when I visited my, wow. my sister with my husband so they also made it clear by stalking my sister before I even arrived and so when I arrived a guy with a black, ho black uh, hat and a black coat was already waiting staring at her and then he stared and grinned at me and through that they really showed me that they had um, my family under observation as well and um, threatening scenes like that followed. Um, I was, um, I can't, I mean, all these these grotesque scenes of gang stalking will be in my court case um, that I witnessed when I was in Oxford. But then what really, uh, what really started happening was that they began with break-ins. So several times I came home and I felt that things had been rearranged. But then... Uh, it's it, very Stasi, that, isn't it? It's, uh, it's a set stone. Uh, I believe is the, it, the exactly yeah, it, yeah. it is it is exactly the Zersetzungs program, and uh, the the first time it was really over, overt, so that I could also prove it to myself. It wasn't just a hunch, and and this you know this weird feeling of thinking you're coming home and you think, hang on, did I did I really close my laptop? I don't think yeah. I did, and that sort of stuff. Um, but then eventually when I came home, it was very overt because they um, had rearranged my shoe cupboard. And I had, because Oxford has so little space, <laughs> I had put my shoes in in a very particular order to fit them all. And they had yeah. completely rearranged it in, in a demonstrative fashion so that I couldn't really, you know, put the shoes that I was wearing back into the cupboard. So uh, that's when it, it was clear that they were going in and out of my flat. And um, from, from the time I, I went to the high court uh, as, as an observer at the time, my life completely changed because these people did everything to, to make it clear to me that they were observing me in my private home. Um, at, the, at that time, I wasn't really physically attacked with electromagnetic weapons, but yeah. they, they made it clear that they knew exactly when I'm leaving my flat and so on. And um, sometimes I felt that they were coming in at night when I, when I was sleeping, but that I couldn't really prove. So. Uh, what happened then is I, I felt I can't really go to the police because the, um, you know, these Zersetzungs offenses are all such by design that they are either too ridiculous or too piffling as an offense. Yeah. Um, and I, I didn't really understand what I was the victim of at the time. So I thought, okay, this is just Britain. It's crazy. It's a surveillance society. I'm going back to Germany. It will be fine. 
but um, it followed me to Germany and in Germany it became even you know even harder <laughs> even yeah. more in your face and um, so uh, in Germany I, I kind of tolerated it for I think a year or a year and a half and then I told my husband what was going on and before I was even scared to really tell people because I was intimidated and I thought that people wouldn't believe me and um, and then I, I tried to go and talk to a lawyer and um, I said that I was a victim of stalking and she advised me to get my file from the Verfassungsschutz, which is German domestic intelligence. And they said they have nothing on the file uh, for me. I mean, I haven't committed any criminal offense, but um, now I know that's a complete lie. And the Verfassungsschutz is one of the main uh, bodies organizing this. But um, anyway. So they didn't have anything in terms of criminal records, of course. And then um, my lawyer also told me, uh, so the first meeting I had with her, she was very incredulous. Um, and I met her, uh, I think two months later and her entire attitude changed. And she said, you know, since you have spoken to me, I keep getting calls from uh, actual German officials who work for the government who, who are telling me exactly the same. Uh, so she said, well, if this is a program by German intelligence, I can tell you that there's nothing we can do. And, and that was shocking to hear because it was the first time a lawyer said to me, you know, we have this, this organization in our state called the Secret Service who are totally you know, above the law. There's nothing we can do. And um, so what happened then is that my husband got a job in Switzerland and... Um, yes. You worked at the CERN laboratory, I believe, did you? Um, yes, but that was before all this started. Oh, right. So okay. I, I worked at CERN from 2000, um, uh, starting of 2009 till 2010. Um, and um, yes, so then we left CERN because I actually felt that my, and my husband felt, he was also a particle physicist, he felt that our work in particle physics is not the most that we can contribute to society. So um, he became a consultant and I changed to medical physics. And that's how we both left, um, you know, the particle physics. But originally I am a particle physicist and I was um, for many years also a particle physicist at a big accelerator called DAISY. So that's D-E-S-Y. That's the German electron synchrotron yes, in yeah, Hamburg. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that's you know where, where I come from. But um, when this started, I had already left particle physics. I'd already been uh, a year in medical physics, and I had already submitted a complaint to Oxford University about what I had witnessed um, and what has been done to me in medical physics because my project has been taken from me and I was thrown out of the group by my boss. <laughs> so um, that was actually the first time I met the corruption, the real corruption, and it was affecting me directly. Um, but then by the time I was in Germany, I'd, I'd already long left. And um, what I was doing in Germany is I wanted to start a, um, a company. I wanted to launch a startup and I was attending all sorts of meetings and um, those attempts were totally sabotaged. And that's another aspect of this entire Zersetzungsprogramm. So it's not just stalking, street theater and break-ins. Um, it's yeah. also infiltration and sabotage of business relationships. So the way that's done is that they um, infiltrate. So they, they read your email and listen to your calls and they know where you want to go. And then they place agents um, who are masquerading as either businessmen or something else. And uh, they will literally ridicule you. So they will uh, pretend to be serious and then at some point uh, reveal themselves by saying something ridiculous or literally laughing in your face or, or using one of your conditioning triggers from years before and reveal that they are agents and then henceforth sabotage um, your endeavor and most of yeah. the time use what you told them. So there's serious economic sabotage um, also tied in. And then the final leg <laughs> in this program uh, that I first began experiencing in Germany was physical attacks. And at first I didn't even recognize them as such. I just developed uh, a very strange heart ache like an actual yeah. pain in the heart region that would then disappear just as magically as it appeared the day I went to the doctor for blood test. Yeah. My blood samples would be stolen. Then um, a few months later, I developed a strange headache that would disappear the day I went to the MRI. 
and at the MRI I was stalked all the way into the um, into the uh, surgery, into the waiting room. An agent um, did street theater and then went in to talk to the doctors. And then during the MRI, I was injected with something that gave me, uh, at the time I thought it's muscle twitching, but now I know I was injected with some sort of nanotech. Um, sure. But then henceforth, um, as soon as I came out of the, um, of the MRI, my headache had gone. But a few hours later, um, my muscles started twitching in a systematic pattern. And um, I noticed it when I went back, I went home and then I just, I was sitting at my desk and suddenly individual muscles uh, first would twitch three times and then it would change to another muscle which would uh, twitch three times and then so on. And bit by bit over the coming weeks, every single muscle group in my body would be systematically triggered. And I would have days when, you know, <coughs> muscles Sorry. would be individually triggered, starting from my left shoulder going down along my left arm, my left leg, and then up my right leg and my right arm. And this was, at that point, it was cl pretty clear that um, I, my muscles seemed to be remote controlled, you know, remote triggered. Wow. So, um, uh, you know, and it's interesting because now, based on what I know now about biorobotization, nanotech, microchips and electromagnetic weapons, yeah. I can in retrospect analyze what exactly had happened. But at the time, all I knew was that something funny was going on with me and I was being somehow manipulated. And when these muscle twitches started, I thought, hmm, so muscles, well, they are working with electromagnetic pulses. Perhaps I'm being pulsed somehow. And that's when I first looked into um, electromagnetic uh, inter as, um, interference so with, with the body. And um, I very quickly came across electromagnetic weapons. Um, and I looked into it a bit, but um, I still couldn't quite believe it, you know. So uh, what happened then is I was, um, uh, we were living in Munich at the time. And after we moved to this flat, which I think was an arranged um, event, we were desperate for a flat as we were moving yeah. down to Munich for, for the job one of my dad. became available, eh? Exactly. And one was just became, became available. And then months after we moved in, I just happened to look on Google Maps and suddenly I discovered, hang on, we're literally a kilometer and a bit away from the headquarters of German intelligence in Pullach. So that's Co called... Coincidence, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, yeah. So um, just to finish off the, the sequence, so what happened sure. then is that I was, um, uh, so in, when we lived in Munich, the, the gang stalking didn't just explode. I, I literally saw, pantomimed out, how the training uh, for young agents was being done. And um, I, there were certain days in the year when I was stalked only by children. There were certain days um, when I was, or entire weeks sometimes, when I was stalked exclusively by Chinese people <laughs> or Asian looking people. And I used to call it, you know, the Asia weeks at the BND. So the BND is the BND is the German Bundesnachrichtendienst. That's German intelligence. Um, and then also I, um, I saw how German intelligence was training up the infiltrators that they sure. would then use for the uh, refugee streams. Because I'm not sure if you remember, but the refugee streams arrived in, I think, September 2015. Yes. Correct. And um, in about, I think, April or May 2015, so roughly six months before, all my stalkers, or pretty much all, apart from senior handlers, changed to black people and, and um, people of Middle Eastern looks. And that was very, t it was itchy from one day to the next because I used to have a bike round. I used to go on a one hour bike um, round going through Pulach and coming back along the river. Um, beautiful yeah. nature, forest. Uh, at the time, I didn't know I'm cycling along, a, I think, one of the biggest, uh, you know, underground military bases in Europe. But, you know, yeah. it was pretty. Um, but I used to be stalked um, in a very particular pattern with um, certain watch posts along the way. And people will be either standing at the same spot, um, smoking or just popping out of a shop, always at the same spot. And in between these um, watch posts, there would be people who would be walking particularly slowly. 
So over over a year or two, I worked out who the stalkers were and where these key um, stalking posts were because I did the same round every single day. And then suddenly the people who I knew to be stalkers at these key posts were all black and Mid Middle Eastern. And in Polach, this is very noticeable because I have not seen a single black person before that time in Polach. And um, you, you have to kind of know that with the, um, German, the headquarters of German intelligence being there and uh, a huge, uh, it's like it's called a, um, a villain gig. It's like a, um, an area where there are only big mansions. So city villas and stuff like that. Very rich people live there. And it's pretty clear um, that these are the, uh, the employees of German intelligence and their retired members. And I have to say, they're all uh, uh, German Aryan, <laughs> you know, yes. they are the old Nazi families who are running German intelligence. And, yeah. um, you know, there's, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a German of German heritage, German Hungarian heritage, and I've got me, a German. Me, me too. I, I don't know whether you can guess from my name. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. I see. I, yes, you, you, you're, you're, um, so you are in, in the UK now, is that right? Yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 my, my parents were German, but moved to the UK. Uh -huh. so I'm, yeah, so I, I, um, I, I must say that, like, su such is the, such is, I, I mean, I grew up in London, and, you know, so this, I had that, um, embarrassingly, I had that classic UK thing of I never really learned to speak another language. My parents never spoke German. Uh, the, their parents never taught me German because they wanted to have private conversations that I couldn't understand. <laughs> uh, so, so I, I, my, my German is, is rather poor. I'm working on it, but uh, I wish, I wish it was fluent. But, uh, uh, but yeah, sorry, continue. <laughs> so, uh, see, see, that's that's very very interesting because um, I, I will tell you why um, in, in a bit. Um, so, um, uh, so what happened is that so I, I witnessed all that and I, I literally uh, I, I learned with the trainees how this entire system worked um, and I, I learned some of their hand signs and body signals and so on. So. Um, you know, I very quickly, I well, quickly, I can't say quickly, but you know, with time, I figured out how this thing kind of works. And um, but then also in 2015, I think it was, uh, oh yes, it was the, exactly the first of July 2015. I was attacked standing on my rooftop terrace from a helicopter with something that could have been a sonic weapon, but could also have been an electromagnetic weapon. I, I don't quite know. I was standing under glass roof at the time and a helicopter that was flying around suddenly stopped above my head and um, irradiated me that with something that felt like intense pressure waves. So maybe that was a sonic weapon. Um, I'm not quite sure what the transmission uh, is for, you know, sonic waves through glass. No idea. But it, it literally felt like uh, you're standing next to the pressure valves in a swimming pool, you know, underwater. Um, and that definitely came from this helicopter. This attack lasted about 10 or 10 or so seconds or 10, 15 seconds. And then this thing flew off. And then six weeks later, I was irradiated just like that in the middle of the night, but this time coming from a neighbor. Uh, the, the neighboring flat and um, that was also a pattern that has followed me to this day so um, people in neighboring flats when I moved somewhere would either die or move away or something very strange would happen to them and then I would move there and um, from the flat where the person died uh, or you know disappeared or something um, I would be irradiated and attacked and um, talking to other victims and my team members, I, I now have figured out that this is what intelligence agencies seem to do routinely. If they want a flat, they will just kill the person. It literally is that bad. Yeah. So yeah. Um, then what happened um, after that? So this was just this one really definite attack with electromagnetic weapons. And otherwise, I just had really strange joint aches that seemed to just, you know, come and go. Um, and always in the same part of the room, very, very odd. And I didn't really twig it at the time. And then we moved to Switzerland and um, the stalking continued in Switzerland. And then on, uh, I had another demonstrative break-in at the start of 2016 um, when we came back from the Christmas holidays. And when I said, right, I'm going to go to the police now and just report everything, um, that's when I was attacked with a microwave weapon for the very first time. So I was, my hand and my, my foot were, were burned. 
And um, from that day onwards, starting in January 2016, I have been attacked and, and mutilated and um, injured with electromagnetic weapons every single day. Um, wow. So I have um, microwave weapons when you're being shot at, um, or maybe it's, as I still am trying to tell the difference between a sonic weapon and an electromagnetic weapon, but I yeah. think these are electromagnetic weapons that they go through walls. And when you're being shot at, um, what, what it does is it um, literally boils your blood. Uh, it certainly yeah. it, it um, pops the capillaries, so you end up massively bruised. So I, you know, started waking up with bruises all over my body. And um, with time, the attacks just became ever more brutal, um, ever more painful, ever more crippling. And um, so I went to court after a few months. I first heard about the um, Philip Kerr case and I flew to the UK and spoke to Philip Kerr and his partner um, after the court hearing. And um, then I had my own court cases, um, which were massively sabotaged. I... Um, I was after the very first hearing coming out of the high court, I was stalked all the way to the hotel and in the hotel I was so um, brutally attacked, I collapsed from pain twice and the second time before my husband. And um, since then what has happened is that um, uh, in May this year, so May 2017, I found out that I'm implanted because my colleague Melanie Richan actually I first wanted to measure her body implants with a bug detector because she knew she had them. She already had a professional measurement in a Faraday cage and uh, we wanted to calibrate this bug detector on her and she looked at me closely and then she saw that I have got scars on my neck and I've got scars in my face and she said oh you seem to be implanted too and she held this bug detector up to my neck and it literally set off. So at the time we were measuring in a Faraday cage. And um, so then I started looking into, into implants. I also went to uh, the headquarters of Swiss intelligence and I requested in person a cease and desist from a senior guy, um, a, a senior, a guy who identified himself as senior members of Swiss intelligence. And, um, and nevertheless, uh, I was implanted demonstratively in June uh, of 2017 when they broke into my flat and they slit my navel open and they put a microchip in. So um, now I'm in the situation where I am being, I, they continue to mutilate me. I've, they have just come in here. I'm, so I'm here with my family in Germany and they've broken in and they put something into my eye because I woke up with a cut to my eye and now my eye is inflamed. Um, and they literally continue to mutilate people. And I have now made, I think, 10 cease and re uh, desist requests to all British, German and Swiss intelligence. I have, I had a court case. I have written to all of these. Um, I have written to the attorney generals in Britain and Switzerland. And um, what has become clear, oh yes, and I also found, founded this investigative, investigative team in January, 2017. And um, what has become clear is that the Western intelligence agencies are not just on a mutilation spree, they are conducting a silent holocaust. Yeah. And um, it is in full swing. We have reports of all these uh, dead people. There's also um, a victim in Ireland and she put out videos where she literally fled to a church and you can hear her voice shaking as she's telling about all the people dying in her community in Dublin. Uh, and um, so as I and yes, I keep getting more and more um, uh, contacts from from credible victims who have cases and who are preparing court cases. And the situation we we're faced with now in Britain, Germany and Switzerland and France, these are the countries. Oh, yes. And Poland, yeah. I know for sure about is that we have an, an active Holocaust in full swing. Uh, I, was, I mean, this was something I wanted to ask you about. I mean, like, what? I mean, that, I, mean I, I mean, I obviously, I, I, I believe everything that you've said, and I think that one thing that people miss when they dismiss um, claims such as your, well, you know, cases such as yours, um, is that even if you, and I'm not saying you are, you're, you're obviously not on a starting scale, but if, even if you were a fantasist and you, know, you were, you know. Um, uh, completely and utterly wrong about everything that you've just said. The fact of the matter is, the, ta the tactics that you've described are documented as have, we, have been used and currently in being in use in, by many intelligence. 
certain services around the world. Moreover, the technology you described exists. So if it's not happening to you, it's happening to someone else. Um, if you get my meaning? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 um, uh, but, but I mean, but I, th- I guess, like, I mean, you know, wh- why? Uh, I mean, this is a two twofold question. Why you? Uh, 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 but also, more generally, why are they doing this to people? Okay, to, so. To your mind? Yes, I um I I can answer both and um so the the second why me I'm still investigating and I think I've um I I there are several reasons um I it why it could be why me but uh, first of all let's start globally maybe it's easier to understand yes. the, my best current knowledge why they are doing this is that this is agenda 21 so agenda 21 is the UN agenda for the 21st century and they put pretty much black and white that they want to get rid of, uh, I think, half of us or two thirds. And um, they couched it in very nice language of sustainability and um, what has been written down. And um, this is also part of other UN pronouncements that I'm now piecing together bit by bit. Um, So I think what we've come to discover, just like in finance, people discovered that the central banks are not what they are masquerading to be. Uh, the central banks are private banks. Um, I, we also will discover that the UN is not what it's actually pretending to be. And the UN, to my best current knowledge, is actually the public face or one of the public faces of the global crime cartel. Yeah. It's extraterritorial. It is now, uh, in a sense, a state in its own right. It is like the Vatican. It has extraterritorial um, areas around the world. And I have seen hints and, and indications of, uh, uh, well, circumstantial evidence, certainly, that it's also, it has uh, become its own nuclear power. So it has an arsenal of nuclear weapons. Uh, and suddenly we, we wake up and we see, hang on, the UN has all these many, many people. Also, all its personnel has got immunity around the world. So these people have, have literally a license to kill yeah. in on paper. And um, when the UN came out with Agenda 21, there are several people who um, cottoned on to this and are very concerned that are, and are campaigning. One of them is called, um, hang on, her surname is, is Corey. I forgot her first name. Uh, uh, Laura? I'll have to look into it. Maybe it's Laura, uh, Laura Corey, um, and she's campaigning because she has um, she has uncovered that what they are doing is Agenda Twenty One is is a global agenda of of communism. So um, it will be this extraterritorial uh, body called the UN, uh, a group of people who we don't really know who they are and where they come from. And uh, they will determine which areas in a country are, can be populated, where can you build a house, which uh, should be renaturalized. And that's very interesting because, for example, the California forest fires fall uh, into the renaturalization zones. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen the, the images of the houses that have literally been, uh, they have vaporized. <laughs> they, no, no, please send that over. So this is what has been sent to me by Karen Stewart, the the, uh, lady who worked for NSA for 30 years. But there are now images from the um, California fires that show that the so-called fires didn't actually affect a single tree. And I think the the area has eucalyptus trees, amongst others, which are highly flammable. And these fires didn't affect the trees, but they totally wiped the houses. So every single house has been burned to the ground clinically. And they are saying, oh, that looks very much like a directed energy weapon from space. So um, when you put these puzzle pieces together um, and you also have um, these things that are called the Georgia Guidestones that are these sculptures that appeared um, everywhere around the world saying that, you know, the population of the world should be something like 500 million. Um, And then you have the reports of people dying everywhere. Um, It's it's uh, I would say that the reason why they are doing it is that this is part of Agenda 21 and the directed energy weapons are the weapons testing and the bio-robotization human experimentation branch of this global systematic holocaust. But uh, the uh, uh, genetically manipulated uh, foods that we know are carcinogenic are also playing into this. 
and there are also yeah. credible reports from victims that um, actual toxins, parasites and pathogens are being actively spread, uh, sometimes through their water supply, sometimes uh, they are being poisoned in their flats and so on. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, yeah, it would be great if you could send across any, you know, any documentation uh, you have to not only back up your, spe your specific um, your, 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 uh, yeah, your, your, your specific case, but also more generally this kind of environment in which this is occurring. No, um, just uh, because, you know, ob you know, you know ob obviously some people will kind of almost reflexively find this quite hard to swallow. And it's, I think it's always best to, you know, present the, uh, the best, you know, uh, present as much documentation as possible to back it up, which you evidently do have. So that would be fantastic. Yeah, so right. everything I'm talking about is now being written up into into not just one court case, but several. So um, um, you, you have to be aware that the uh, the amount of uh, work to get as we have, I've got about, I think, 500 gigabytes of uh, wow. evidence and references. <laughs> Yeah, maybe and, not that much. Yeah, that so much. what I'm working on right now, also for the court cases I support in February, is to to cut it down to the um, you know to the <laughs> the logical steps and the, the key evidence that you need to understand what's going on. Um, but there's there's so much more that actually um, goes into this because I have a stack of victim cases, so I, I get lots of cases which are fake and actually just agents, you know, making up yeah, stories. Sure. Yeah. But um, wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, but the ones that I I do find credible, um, what is emerging there is it is one to one a Nazi agenda. So the most credible victims I have are victims, for example, who have Asperger's or mothers with children who have Asperger's or children with Down syndrome. And um, there it's pretty clear what's happening. These children were picked because they can't express themselves. So their bodies are being uh, shredded for weapons testing. And the intelligence agencies use the fact that these kids can't communicate. Uh, some can, some can't. Or they're not believed. Yeah. And... Um, and somehow doctors have a tendency once uh, a, a child has got, for example, Asperger's to assume that, oh, yes, well, you can smear it with uh, schizophrenia because in inverted commas, there's clearly something wrong with its brain. But I just want to point out that the probability for Asperger's uh, and schizophrenia are totally independent <laughs> statistically. So to have both is even more unlikely than to have each individually. Um, so that's one image that's emerging. The other image that's emerging is that certainly in America and also in the UK, black people and Asians are targeted uh, and targeted particularly ferociously. And that's, you know, classic, uh, yeah, Nazi, <laughs> the Nazi program. And also I have evidence, written evidence um, by agent whistleblowers that, um, and not just one, many actually, that say that the heads of intelligence, British intelligence, are actually eugenicists. So, for example, if you remember Sir John Scarlett, who uh, lied uh, about the weapons of mass destruction and thereby enabled yeah. the Iraqi Holocaust, yeah. well, he's also reported several times to be a eugenicist. He, in other words, is a Nazi. Well, the, the thing, the thi I mean, the thing that I think is that, like, I mean, a, a lot of, you know, people will probably dismiss this as hyperbole or exaggeration, but I mean, fundamentally, if you think, I mean, the, I mean, I can only talk about the British root class um, from my own experiences, but you know, I mean, the conservatives particularly, like they, they might not come out and say, oh, I'm a eugenicist, but their policies and indeed kind of indirect statements very much suggest that they are, and, and indeed in the seven, and I think that this is, I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean, as you mentioned with the UN, like you need to, the, 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 the ruling elites know that you need to couch this in fluffy language and do it kind of incrementally and slowly because in the 1970s i'm not sure whether you heard of this guy called keith joseph yes the the rivers yeah, of in, blood yeah yeah no no that's that's, that's enoch powell that's oh that's enoch powell yeah, no, sorry no, sorry but, yeah but, but so keith joseph he was a kind of arch thatcherite who was kind of pushing for thatcherism before it happened and he was coming out with stuff saying that the number of children that working class people should be able to have should be limited oh yes and that's think, the right story yes actually did call for the sterilization of the working class and oh my other, gosh amongst other, I, amongst other things i didn't and, even and know that i didn't even know that but this yeah, is this yeah, is fantastic evidence like, yeah yeah and obviously 
obviously this was, you know, there was uproar about this at the time. And so it was, you know, while, you know, lots of people share his, you know, kind of his goals and indeed his principles, if you can call them that. But, you know, and like they, um, they, they realised that, well, we can't come out with this publicly. And then you have other examples where like Boris Johnson came out and said, uh, and it was after Margaret Thatcher died, and he said, oh, well, you know, fundamentally 40% of the population are always going to be useless and stupid and lazy. So there's no point trying to create a better world for them with, you know, with better education and more opportunities and stuff. And he was attacked by, by people within the conservative circles genuinely because they thought that he'd been far too open about his intentions not 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 the not the kind of the the substance of what he was suggesting which they said that, yeah we agree with this but what we disagree with is you coming out this public because it's unhelpful and that's really interesting and yeah and i think the fun you know fun, like, fun, fundamentally at the core of you know so many things whether it's gutting the national health service in this country or indeed even the um i mean i'm, I'm actually currently writing articles about this like in the uk Police numbers have been reduced and budgets have been reduced by twenty percent to the point where you know in certain areas of London, which are you know where there are you know which are high crime areas, you might have only ten police officers on on duty at one time. And you can, I mean, in our, my area, which is by no means like you know by no means uh, seriously impoverished, but isn't particularly rich either. You know, it's rare. I, you know, I can go weeks without seeing a police car. I mean, and from I mean from my perspective as a kind of anarchist, um, I I actually quite like that. But at the same time, it's like, you know, there are, you know, stabbings are up, murders are up, um, you know, uh, you know, all, 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 you know de- like deaths in general, whether through misadventure or whatever, are massively up. And you've got to think, well, you know, there's no re- there's the, the only reason you would cut the police is to create, is to allow more crime to happen. Exactly. And that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. And so, you know, like, and I, 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 yeah, I guess that, that yeah, that feeds into it too. Uh, absolutely and uh now <laughs> this is very interesting to hear because i i have left the uk in uh yeah. september 2012 and i i had several short trips but i you know i'm only following it in the news but i'm not at the pulse of the you know of the of what's happening yeah. in the country anymore but um it's so interesting because what i get is i get all the victims who report and have video evidence of being stalked by police cars and even yeah. helicopters in london so, you know, while, while people, while, while these areas are not police, the entire police and MI5 helicopters following oh, individuals. Yeah, and, and, but, also, but also as well, I mean, I think that, like, they, they, I mean, if you talk to anyone who actually knows about the history of British intelligence, like the kind of, you know, the kind of stalking or like, you know, kind of, hara- her, her, you know, kind of bizarre harassment and the kind of you know, inexplicable harassment. And I'm talking about, you know, like people coming to your door and just smiling at you and then walking away. Like that is, that is, that is absolutely bread and butter what the intelligence services do in this country. And I'll, I'll actually, I'll send you a link to this, but there's this guy called Anthony Varney who, um, he lived, sorry, my, my Skype keeps on exploding, but yeah, the, um, uh, the, 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 there's a, the, there's a guy called Anthony uh, Varney who was, um, in the 1980s, I believe it was, he moved to a village in the UK and it was with, it was near a, um, uh, a, a kind of British weapon research center and his house would at night kind of be filled with these awful noises and it would vibrate and it turned his hair white because of possibly because of stress, possibly because it was some kind of, you know, biological weapon. And um, he complained and the the, you know, the response of the authorities was yes, to just send people to harass him and, you know, you'd get yeah. strange letters or he'd see people in his garden and when he went out they'd disappear and like all of this stuff. And it's about, you know, making people feel intimidated, scared to speak, but also creating these kind of inexplicable and, you know, quite bizarre things which if you said to the average person, they probably think someone was just being paranoid or just making it up or imagining things. Yeah, absolutely. And and for me, there's a there's a um, so because I'm a scientist, there's a set way to um, to because I mean, if you like, in uh, you know at CERN or as a as a particle physicist, we we have to deal with the unusual, the highly unlikely, and and detect also stuff that's not known not known yet and there is a way to to tell there's even a way to detect classified military research even when it's not declassified and that yeah. is to just use um large enough statistics so what i'm trying to do now actually late on today if i if i manage i will release an affidavit template um for global survey to actually collect all these things that have been happening but um when i get a victim sometimes totally unrelated victims and and sometimes very uneducated victims will in great detail 
describe uh, the symptoms of, of a technology that I have got the patent for, you know? So I have a list of patterns and I, I kind of can estimate what these things can do. And then when you have a group of people from different parts of the world, totally unrelated, never met each other, describing in great detail exactly the same thing, well, that's a certain technology. But evidence like that also stands up in court because it also stands up in science. That's that's very much how it's, yeah, how it's done. And also there's another way, I, I'm not sure, on my website under the FAQ section, I even um, have a document where I'm proving uh, that, first of all, there's, in, in the UK you've got something called the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. Yes, yes. So that's the secretive court that was set up, I think, in 2000 or 2001. To, yeah, it's, um, a, it's a terrorism act, yes. Exactly, and to, to uh, deal with all the cases pertaining to the intelligence agencies. Now, when you just look at their past record of dealing with cases, you can use their own published statistics to prove that they are a corrupted court. The, I yeah. think 99% of all the cases get turned down. And then when you look at yeah. how many cases you would expect them to have, so how many, um, how many mistakes do you expect an, an intelligence agency to throw up, even if they were well-intentioned, which I'm pretty sure they are not, but even if they were, and these were genuine just mistakes, you know, when you're running a big corporation, something yeah. always goes wrong and there are always a certain fraction of customers who will be, you know, treated unfairly. It, that's just normal in a big system. Now, when you have something like the intelligence agencies, and they are massive, they have just recently doubled. In 2003, they doubled <laughs> in size, in their funding, and they are claiming that they only have 10 serious cases, you know, over a 10-year period. Well, they are lying, and you can actually calculate how many cases they are covering up. And it's in the hundreds of thousands. And the numbers of, of victims with serious injuries is also numbering in the tens of thousands um, in the UK alone. So uh, we have a huge problem on our hands. And, um, and it's, it's interesting you mentioned the um, Nazi ideology in Britain because in Britain also, so Britain was rebu rebuked, <laughs> ironically, by the UN even. So yeah. imagine how much that takes. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, it, um, they were rebuked for um, the way they treated disabled people. And um, what is, has become clear now, but I mean, with clear, it's, it's been clear long ago for people who, have, who know about finance, but it's now publicly known that country debt is a scam. It yes. is a mathematical yeah. trick. So what you are paying is we're paying um, the, the bankers for their profit on a loan. So, um, and that has gone non-linear through the normal mathematics of interest on interest. And, um, and that's what this entire country debt scam is about. So austerity is a scam, but um, yes, austerity... Of course it is. But it's, I mean, I, this is one thing that fright, well, really frightens me about austerity is that like, even though it's been repeatedly blown apart by you know, academics, also just by personal experience, and, you, know, you, just, you can point to the fact that the, fact, you know, the countries that had a similar level of debt to, say, the UK um, didn't, didn't, pursue, that didn't pursue austerity are doing far better economically than the UK is. People still believe it. They, they 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 say, oh well, we just we spent too much on unemployment benefit, or we spent, and it's just it's absolutely ludicrous. There is not a scrap of evidence to indicate that. But so like millions of people believe this, and it's it's absolutely infuriating to meet them today, and especially someone who trained in economics like I did, and just like hearing hearing these people who know not, absolutely nothing about economics have never never you know read a, read a single textbook or paper. They're coming out with such nonsense, but doing so so authoritatively because they've been told by the media that this is the case. It's fr it's frightening. It, it it is absolutely frightening, and and also yeah. what what it does is um the uh, the reason why I stress austerity particularly is because um it hit disabled people, but if you turn it around and you just look at the effect, what Britain has actually implemented, it it was a genocide of disabled people. It was a targeted killing oh, off. Oh, sorry. An actual genocide of disabled oh, 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 people, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, Britain. So the yes, Im yes, implementation. Yes, yes, yes. So I I have to check the the numbers of how many people died, but it was over a hundred thousand. I mean, I think this is another thing as well. Is is, is uh, yes, that you're right. And I think another thing as well that again feeds into into this is the fact that um, uh, I'm not sure whether you're familiar, but there was a huge there were lots of changes made to the benefit system, and, and because the Conservatives claimed, oh well, someone could just turn up and claim they've got a cold and get welfare which is nonsense and so they they instituted these 
assessments. So people who are claiming un, you know uh, incapacity benefit or you know sickness benefit or, or whatever because um, they couldn't work because of you know serious mental or physical health issues or or disable or disablement um, would be be assessed by ATOS. You know, it's that French. Yes. Um, yeah, and they uh, and they. Um, that, like there were, there were there were innumerable cases of people who were who were you know kind of blind and couldn't walk who had serious emphysema who was who were judged entirely fit to work who died within hours of their ATOS assessment or you know or like or died within days or weeks of it happening and you know for instance my um, uh, my friend's mother she is she suffers from severe mental health problems and needs kind of constant round the clock care to ensure that she doesn't kill herself or indeed you know, harm someone else. Um, and, yeah, she was judged fit to work last week. Yeah. No, and, and it's, no, no, go on, sorry. And, and, you know, it's it's so insane that um, it's, uh, yeah, if, when you just turn it around, I think what what we got wrong in our in our world is is the the world view. You know, I mean, we have a biased view, and to this day, it doesn't matter how outrageously they behave, we still assume that it's all with the best of intentions. Yeah. We still assume that Atos is actually a genuine company. But um, what yeah. if we just turn around and we say, hang on, what if? There is an actual Nazi genocide going on around the world, an actual little Holocaust. And what we're seeing here is the old Nazi program of we have to exterminate all the disabled people. We literally have to kill them off. Um, and then, for example, your friend's mother, if she is forced to work and she goes out and she hurts somebody, she will end up in the prison system. And the yeah. people in the prison system are used all, you know, straight out for human experimentation. Um, and they yeah. have a you know high <laughs> high rate of dying um so uh yeah and uh i if i just look at the numbers i have to say we have this this whole nazi machinery in full swing and then when i sp um speak to my nsa colleagues so i'm working with somebody from the nsa um yeah, the sure. um whistleblower karen melton stewart and she was at the NSA for 28 years, but her area of specialization is exactly weapons development and proliferation. Yeah. Um, and then there are two people, I'm not sure if you've heard about the Global Victim Survey <clears throat> by uh, the former technical director of the NSA, Bill Binney, and his colleague Kirk Wiebe. Um, they conducted a very large survey last year. And um, I think the results are not yet out, but the fact that you have the former technical, the former, sorry, sorry, oops, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, hello. Oh, so sorry, I, I just heard. I think my own uh, voice back. Um, oh, okay, so. Sorry. No, I, I was just thinking that um, if uh, it, when you have a situation where you have literally the, the former technical director of the NSA looking into a type of criminality, well, he doesn't do it if he even had a whiff of thinking it's frivolous, you know. So um, this is just how serious the entire matter is. Um, and, 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 and also, I have to say that um, in, within the team, my colleague, um, Dr. Melissa Black, so she's uh, African-American and lives in Tennessee. And what she has mapped out is a, a systematic murder of her family um, by an Air Force veteran. Yes. Um, and the, the way that her family members uh, were murdered um, and, and the horrific injuries that they were given in, in years of torture leading up to that, we recognize the same amount, the same type of injuries in other people. So people lose, for example, their legs, you know, and it's very unusual uh, for diabetes to be so out of control that you would lose a leg these days. I mean, that's yeah. very unheard of. But, um, you know, she had friends who would lose their legs when they didn't even have diabetes. Sure. Um, so uh, in summary, uh, what, what we have more and more evidence for is, number one, there is a definite program of killing people off. Yes, yeah. intelligence agencies are involved. The injuries and the reports from victims are identical all across uh, Europe and, and also Australia and, and the US. But, and this is now the last leg in this, uh, the medical industry is in, involved in, in a big fashion. And the implants I found in my body have been partially implanted when they broke into my flat. But also um, I had um, surgery and I was implanted there as well. 
Um, and these are chips that I can measure to be emitting. And I've, I've uh, settled on one bug detector that's super easy to use. And I kind of was trying to teach people how to use it. And I get more and more videos sent where people um, video film themselves in the middle of the forest in a zero background environment. Sure. And they can show that the, the top of their head is emitting like a mobile phone. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know. Now, uh, what, what, where we're at in 2018 is the following, and this is why actually your, um, your interview and everything that you'll write will be super important, yeah. is we have discovered that especially in the UK, the print media um, and the mainstream media is under lockdown. We suspect with D notices, so these are the yes. uh, gagging yeah, yeah, notices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, so, but because of that, um, a, a criminal deep capture in the intelligence agencies uh, can execute a systematic killing off of British people. So this is actually high treason in action now. And uh, we need to break that and we need to draw people's attention to it. And we also need to um, get victims scanned. And there are commentators like Catherine Austin Fitz, who was the former assistant secretary for housing under George W. Bush. And she thinks that um, given that all these terror attacks are entirely fake and entirely orchestrated by the intelligence agencies, she was musing that the airport scanners, the actual big metal detectors and so on, are actually, in, in actual fact, to gauge the chipping level in the population. Yeah. So I and I actually think that's that's entirely uh, credible. So um, yeah, I I keep discovering that more and more people that you wouldn't even think um, end up chipped and. Yeah. Um, but it's, I mean, I think. But again, I mean, I think it's like you just you see that how the kind of incremental process where when you're getting like all of these kind of positive stories about oh, the employees at this Swedish firm were microchipped. They can use it to open doors and even pay for things. Isn't this great? And then, like, and then, and then, and then, it, we're going to get more and more stories about this, where we're going to be told, well, actually, if you're not microchips, you won't be able to do this. Exactly. Like, you know, actually, you don't want to be be weird, do you? You don't want to be one of those off grid people, like you know. And it just goes on, and it'll go on and on to the point where, like, children will be microchips from birth. Yes. Like, and, and like, I, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's. I mean, you see it as well with. Um, uh, uh, yeah, like um, with other kind of forms of implant. So there, I mean, there's a lot of. I mean, I, 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 I've written some tech stories in the past about you know, like the, uh, people who are paraplegic or quadriplegic who have been, you know, kind of had implants put in their heads. And oh well, they can, you know, um, pick things up now when they couldn't, you know, haven't been able to for years. And it's like, oh, isn't it so wonderful and great and positive? But then actually, like, it has a really sinister side. And it will, which will be the actual end goal, um, you know? Absolutely. And we have one case exactly like that already documented. And uh, that's the Air Force veteran, uh, Randall Webster. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, trained in, I think, Washington State um, at yeah. one of these uh, Air Force training bases. And yeah. Washington State had a large scale electromagnetic weapons testing on the population that's already reported. But he also claims that he can steer this weapon system with which he's killing people but with, with the chip implant in his head. Well, I mean, funnily enough, um, Timothy McVeigh, the guy who is accused, well, was accused of and convicted of, even though I, don't, I have absolutely no, um, I have absolutely no doubt he was innocent. Uh, Timothy McVeigh, um, he was microchipped. Um, and spoke and uh, talked about how it would it would it it, it would randomly um, hurt him. Uh, you know, in the he would get random kind of you know, stabbing pains in the area he was microchip. Yes, I, yeah. I that's 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 impressive because I um I have missed that I missed that um he actually claimed that but that's actually very important evidence, um yeah. because uh. So the technology that we have so far uncovered and the victim reports and, and stuff that I've seen myself, I am pretty sure that um, the nanotech compared with the implants can be used to, to actually biohack a person and take them over. And yeah. I have seen my own parents being taken over. Um, and, uh, you know, they would, they would, uh, so I, I told the story many times on air, but uh, they would be 
they started shouting at me. We came to an argument. And then when I changed position in the room, they both continued shouting at the empty room where I stood before. So uh, stuff like that shows you that this technology is much more powerful than we realize. Um, But the actual day-to-day situation that I am in now and all of my team members are in now is that we are being actually physically hurt not just every hour, but pretty much every few minutes, every day and every night. Um, So I have got videoed um, evidence of being uh, shot into in my flat. And um, that's, uh, it actually puts a dent into metal foil. I have got audio recordings throughout every single night of, of, it sounds like rain. It's actually just, uh, you know, uh, individual so-called pulsed energy projectiles uh, machine gunning me. And um, the same applies to my colleague, Ramola. She's being machine gunned nonstop. My colleague, Karen, just uh, spoke to us a few days ago and she said that she's now being hurt so badly she doesn't even know if she will make it, you know, through the next week. Um, And this is absolutely serious. So we have actually a hot war on our hands right now. Um, Anyway, Catherine, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave it there because I need to step into a meeting at 11.30, but um, it's been a really, really, really great chatting with you. And uh, yeah, A, if you could send across the audio um, uh, file, that'd be fantastic. And B, if you could send across any documentation you feel is relevant, I can can curate it and go through it myself. And um, as I say, I will send you a link to the article. Sorry, no, not send you a link. I will send you the article in kind of word format when it's written. And then um, uh, I um, I will uh, what's the word? Um, I, yeah, like if you want to make any amendments, additions, or subtractions, just let me know, and I'll make sure that happens. And uh, and also do stay in touch because um, you're, you're, yeah, it's been fascinating chatting, and uh, yeah, I'd, I, I'd like I'd like to keep in touch. Okay, fantastic. Let's All do right. that. Okay. Right, thank you so much, Catherine. Oh, well, we'll take care and keep fighting the good fight. Good luck. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you too. <laughs> bye. Bye. bye.